Good evening. And welcome to q and I'm Tony Jones, and answering your questions tonight, the political editor of The Guardian Australia, Lenore Taylor. Former Labor minister turned commentator, Graham Richardson. Queensland coalition heavyweight, Senator George Brandis. Outgoing health minister, Tanya Plibersek. And former Victorian Liberal Party president, Michael Kroger. Please welcome our panel. Thank you. And as usual, we're being simulcast on ABC News 24 and News Radio. You can join the Twitter conversation with a hashtag that just appeared on your screen. Well, our first question tonight comes from Elaine Jontek. Michael Kroger, you've said that um, Mr Tony Abbott will surprise us by being a moderate, sensible, middle-of-the-road, cautious Prime Minister. What evidence do you have for that assessment, given uh, his recent form? That's a very accurate quote. Um, thank you for that. Uh, well, I know a number of things about Tony Abbott. I've known him for 35 years since I was at university. He was at Sydney Uni, I was at Monash. Uh, he's come a long way since then. What I know is this. Uh, after 40 years in the Liberal Party, he doesn't have a single enemy. And I have to tell you, anyone involved in the Liberal Party or on Tanya's side knows that's a fair achievement. And he only does that by keeping everyone together. He's a leader of a party. He operates a grand consensus uh, and is a very middle-of-the-road personality. He's kept a very stable front-bench team. He's no longer prone to the odd outbreak that we might have seen in years gone by. And you've seen through his last two election campaigns a very focused, disciplined, middle-of-the-road leader, and that's what he'll be as Prime Minister. He, uh, he referred to himself having been a tribal chief uh, as an opposition leader, but now he was going to govern for everyone. He was actually going to move to the centre, in a way. Do you think that is... Possible, how will he do that? Well, you've got to remember this, Tony. What is the job of the opposition leader? It is to make the case for change. That's the job of a successful opposition leader. If you're an opposition leader who agrees with the other side, you make no case for change, you will not be elected. And by the way, you shouldn't be elected. If you can't map out a distinction between us and the other side, whichever side you're on, then you shouldn't be elected because you've made no case for change. So Tony Abbott made a case for change on many issues, which I don't think we need to go through again right now because we've heard them many, many times. He made that case for change very powerfully, very consistently, and the electorate said, yes, that's the change we want. And, Michael, very briefly, um, the most successful um, Conservative leaders of recent times, Thatcher, Reagan, John Howard even, uh, tried mm. to capture uh, blue-collar voters, as they mm. used to call them, um, Howard's battlers, mm. uh, Reagan's Democrats, etc. Is Tony Abbott on that course? Look, he very much is. And one of the things that you've seen in Australia in recent years is the massive decline in trade union membership. As people seek economic aspiration, they three seek advancement through you know, economic development, you know, working harder for themselves, leaving employment, leaving trade unions, becoming independent contractors, franchisees, etc. People want economic empowerment. That's the type of person that very much appreciates an, a leader like Abbott, like a Howard. Um, now, Latham talked about this over t after 204 as one of Labor's problems, that they're losing touch with that base in the electorate, and Tony will win that back. Tony, please a sec. I don't even know where to start with the list of things I disagree with, with what Michael's just said. Um, start with the top of the list. Uh, the, the top of the list. The, the idea that... Um, uh, well, no, the first thing I want to say is actually I, I hope that this government is very successful because I always think about the nation more than our party. But um, the, the notion that Tony Abbott is some sort of gentle consensus guy is totally uh, at odds with everything we've seen of him, not just in recent years, but across 20 years of his political history. The idea that he's universally popular within the Liberal Party, we just know that's not true. There's plenty of people in the Liberal Party who have bitten their tongue because they have been very focused on winning, and good on them. I mean, they've shown a lot of discipline in biting their tongues, but they were biting their tongues. He barely won that leadership ballot. He won it by one vote against Malcolm Turnbull. Uh, so, uh, look, I, I think that um, there's, uh, there's a lot for Tony Abbott to prove, but one of the, the things that he has to prove first is that he has the temperament to govern. And he's been on a very short leash, leash during the campaign. It's a five-week campaign. Um, whether he can maintain that in the face of uh, potentially a very difficult Senate. I mean, the, the independence in the House of Representatives in 2010 
came with us because they pointed to Tony Abbott's lack of skill as a negotiator. Now he's going to have to negotiate to get his legislation through the Senate, yet to see how that will work out. George Brandis. Well, um, there are two people on the panel who um, have known Tony Abbott um, most of our adult lives, Michael Kroger and me, and I can assure you on um, the basis, like Michael, of more than 30 years of acquaintance with Tony Abbott and more particularly on the basis in the last three or four years of working closely with him on almost a daily basis, that the person Michael Kroger described is Tony Abbott. Uh, the, the person that uh, Tanya Plibersek has just described is a, is a Labor Party caricature which was invented to scare children during the 2013 <laughs> election. Unfortunately, it didn't succeed. And I, I, I can tell you, t Tony, um, the, the, what is significant about Tony Abbott is not that he was elected leader by one vote, but that within a matter of months of being elected so narrowly, he had united the entire party behind him. And the, the electoral success he achieved in 2010, when he fought the first-term government effectively to a draw, and the electoral success that he achieved last Saturday couldn't have happened unless he had had the capacity to unite the entire party behind him. Now, you know, political careers usually follow among... You know, the, the political careers of significant politicians usually follow a reasonably predi predictable trajectory. In the early stages, political people who emerge as political leaders do have to be, um, to use Tony's uh, phrase, tribal chiefs. And then when they reach the leadership of their party, they have to move beyond that and embrace the entire party and appeal to the nation. And then if, as occurred with Tony Abbott last Saturday, they are chosen by the nation, the nation puts their confidence in them, then they, then they transcend their earlier selves and become leaders of the entire nation. I can tell you on the basis of more than 30 years acquaintance with Tony Abbott, that is absolutely his style. Uh, it has marked the way in which he has progressed uh, through what is now quite a long political career. And the, 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 the notion that Tony Abbott is a consensus leader, as Michael Kroger said, is an absolutely accurate uh, characterisation of, of the man he is. Graham Richardson, I'll bring you in. And uh, can we just pick up on uh, something that uh, was said there by George Brandis, which is that Labor's scare campaign about Tony Abbott, well, they focused very heavily on this through the entire campaign, that uh, he, when in power, will slash everything from health to education, et cetera, et cetera. And if that doesn't happen, as it may not, uh, where's that campaign left? Well, I suspect a lot of it won't happen because I think what he'll do is plod. He won't gallop, he'll plod. And he'll plod in the centre of the course. He won't, he won't race to anything. He's already announced basically the budget will only come back into surplus at the same time Labor said it would. He's not going to do anything like the cuts he talked about earlier on. He's backed off from all that. And I think that's where Labor's campaign was probably successful. I think in, in health and education he won't do it because Labor's campaign forced him to say he wouldn't. And I think um, Labor's probably done the nation a bit of a favour in that, in that respect. But I, uh, I think it, it amazes me when... Look, I'd, I'd love to be able to bag him more, but the reality is, if people like Christopher <laughs> Pine, if you look, look, at the, look at the history of the Liberal Party, which I know it's boring, but if you, if you look at it... <laughs> um, it's, people like Christopher Pine were on the left of, of the Liberal Party, and, and they're in love with him. Uh, Brandis was never regarded as a right-wing fanatic either. I mean, so, so there are a lot of people who, who uh, would have regarded themselves as moderates who now support him. So he must have done something to, uh, to bring that into the line. But the last thing I'd say is, um, while well, everyone, of course, will be united, when, when you've won a big majority, when you've got all the power, it's amazing how popular they get in your own show. <laughs> Lenore Taylor. Um, I've got no doubt that Tony Abbott intends, genuinely intends, to be the kind of Prime Minister that Michael and George describe. Uh, and uh, I think he is sometimes painted more as a caricature and he is a bit more complex than that. But there are really big challenges for him in actually making good that promise. Part of the way that he got the discipline during those years in opposition was because he pushed out in decisions on really critical issues where the Liberal and National Parties and the Liberal Party itself are divided, things like competition policy, foreign investment policy, tax policy, even some of the spending measures like the paid parental leave scheme, which people in his own party don't necessarily like. 
Now that he's in government, there's a lot of expectation, you know, from the sort of more economic dry side of the Liberal Party that he will deliver reform, that it won't be wasted years in office. And there will be equally strong pressure from the more interventionist tendencies of the National Party to, you know, to act differently. So I think bridging those divisions will be a big challenge. And the Senate is a challenge. It's certainly a better Senate from George's point of view than if the Greens held the balance of power. But it's another challenge. So, you know, he's got good intentions from the start, but I think delivering on them will be harder than it looks. All right, our next question takes us to the other side of the election equation. It's from Peter King. Thanks, Tony. If I'd have not nodded off on Saturday night and uh, woken to the jubilant e entrance of Kevin Rudd prior to his concession speech, I'd have thought he'd been triumphant. <laughs> I'd like to ask the panel why they think this may, be, may have been the mood of the gathering and how much Kevin Rudd's return to save Labor from a more parlous outcome. Yeah, I'll start with Lenore. Uh, well, I guess because Labor really genuinely uh, expected a much worse result and it was less bad than they expected. Um, I think this question, uh, would Julia Gillard have done better, did Kevin Rudd save the furniture? If the Labor Party keeps asking this question, then they're going to be in opposition for a really, really long time. You know, there's been some breakouts today of people talking about whether Kevin Rudd should in fact leave the parliament. Um, you know, three days ago, they put him up and asked the country to trust him to be the prime minister. And now some of his own side are saying they don't trust him to be on their back bench. If they don't draw a line under this thing and really realise that the people of Australia are thoroughly, utterly sick of it, then I think they're going to be on those opposition benches for a really long time. Graham Richardson. Well, I, I, uh, I think that it was a better result for Labor than I expected. Um, and you've got to remember, when you, you wonder about the jubilation up there, this was, after all, Queensland. This is the place where Labor's got, what is it, uh, seven out of 80-something? They got almost wiped out in the state election. <clears throat> and everybody was predicting that the only seat they'd hold in, in Queensland would be Rudd's, if that. And the results didn't reflect that. They did a lot better than they thought they would, a lot better than George would have, would have thought they would. I think he'd concede. So, therefore, a lot of people in Queensland were happy about it. Mind you, the 26 minutes or whatever it was, I thought was embarrassing. Um, I thought he went to the uh, Rob Oakeshott School of Oratory. He, uh, he, he could e easily have done it in 15 minutes. And I think had he done so, there would have been a little more dignity about it. But if we're all going to spend the rest of our lives convincing ourselves what a terrible bastard he was, fair enough, I'm already convinced. I don't need to talk about it anymore. <laughs> Uh, Graham, I'm going to make you talk about it just a little more because, as you just heard uh, Lenore <coughs> suggest, um, there's been breakouts already. I mean, over the weekend it began, but the calls tonight from Craig Emerson for him to stand aside, <coughs> blaming him for everything that's gone wrong in the Labor Party. It's not only that either. The insiders in the campaign HQ have started suggesting the Rudd team were uh, chaotic during the campaign. Yeah. Now you've got the other side answering back. You've got the head of the... Uh, campaign saying it was all the fault of the HQ. I mean, this is a classic Labor stuff, isn't it? No, it's classic human nature. Whenever there's a, a cock-up, it's always it was his fault. It's never mine. It's always his. You don't have to say it publicly. Um, you and can just I say think, it to each other. You know what? This is the Labor Party we're talking about. <laughs> um, that, that was really my point. I, I think, um, I've, as I've said before, I've never witnessed the depth of hatred that developed over this. It was extraordinary. You know, I went through the Hawke-Keating battle uh, which went for a year or so, and people were a bit unhappy with themselves, but, you know, I, my best mate was Robert Ray, who was on the other side. We, it didn't have any effect. We remained close. That didn't happen here. There, there was just a bitterness that I, I found, you know, really disturbing. But I think Labor's just got to put it behind them. I mean, uh, look, I think Craig Emerson's attempts at singing did as much harm as anything Kevin Rudd or Julia Gillard could have done. He ought to hide, that bloke, or at least he should never sing again. Um, <laughs> And I've got to respect Julia Gillard and Wayne Swan and Stephen Conroy and, and Peter Garrett or, you know, and Nicola Roxon, who, whoever, were so strongly on her side. Um, they said nothing during the campaign. They said nothing either publicly or privately. They didn't brief anyone. They didn't background anyone. So I think I'd give them a few days. If they want to come out and have a crack now, I think I'll, I'll say, well, fair enough, after holding you your tongue for so long you're allowed a little bit of a go, but let's have it over by about Wednesday or Thursday and get on with life. Mm. Michael Kroger. Look, a few points. It's a very good question. Um, firstly, at 23 minutes, it was almost as long as the extended version of American Pie, but not nearly as good. And um, that was absurd. Secondly, not to mention Julia Gillard in that speech was incredibly ungracious. And thirdly, 
I stood uh, four feet from Malcolm Fraser on the 5th of March 1983 when he resigned the Liberal Party leadership and the Prime Ministership when he lost, tearfully resigning, you might remember, in the Southern Cross Hotel in Melbourne. Fraser resigned tearfully because he recognised the gravity of what he'd done. He had led the Liberal Party in government to a defeat. And in that room that night was an incredibly solemn mood. No one was applauding, no one was happy, no one was cheering. Contrast to Saturday night. As you said, with the sound down, you'd think he'd won. Kevin Rudd um, is all about Kevin Rudd. Kevin Rudd is not about the Labor Party and never has been. This man spent two years ripping down Julie Gillard and then having ripped her down, says to the party, I've let, set fire to the place, give me the hose, I'll put it out. That was an absurdity, of, uh, you know, unparalleled absurdity to make this bloke leader again, having ripped down Gillard. There was a, there was a ballot last year, remember February last year, the vote was 31-71. Immediately after that ballot, Gillard's primary vote dropped 4%. February this year, when Rudd didn't challenge, but there was going to be a challenge, what happened? Primary vote again dropped 4%. So we get to the situation now where Gillard's vote is trashed by June 26 this year, and he says to everybody, you better vote for me, look how badly Gillard's going. Well, of course she's going badly, mate. And what happens? The culture of the Labor Party is so weak, they dump Gillard and reward the man that set fire to the House. And on Saturday night, he's laughing and carrying on as if it doesn't matter. What a joke. OK, Tanya, for a second, that is essentially Craig Emerson's <coughs> argument, as a matter of fact. So um, it's not only a, a Liberal Party heavyweight who's saying that, it's your own side and it's continuing. And what I um, am going to do and what I think all of my colleagues should do is focus on our record, be proud of our achievement. I would give us nine out of ten for governing the country. And, <laughs> yeah, we... A million jobs. We got through the global financial crisis. Our economy is 16% larger now than at the beginning of the global financial crisis. We've got three AAA credit ratings from three uh, uh, ratings agencies, something that uh, Costello never achieved uh, for all his boasting about what a great treasurer he was. We had a strong economy at the same time as introducing disability care, at the same time as investing in education and changing to needs-based funding for education, at the same time as investing massively in health and changing our health system to activity-based funding system and a greater emphasis on primary care. Like, this is a great record and history will treat it well. What history will not treat well was our internal division. And I am not going to talk about it. I'm not going to give character analysis of, uh, of Kevin or anyone else. I'm not going to start pointing the finger. You will not hear from me in public or in private uh, any of this type of recrimination because the longer we engage in it, the longer it will take us to heal. Let me ask you this or put it in this way. <laughs> You don't have to put this in a personal way, but what lessons uh, will the next generation of Labor leaders learn from the rise and fall of Kevin Rudd? Well, I'll tell you, the, the lesson that we all have to learn from this uh, in the Labor Party, members of Parliament, party officials, party members, is that disunity is death. And uh, that our discipline let us down, and it let us down more than once. And uh, if people don't learn that lesson, then Lenore's right. We will be in opposition for a long time. I think that we can be competitive quickly, but how quickly we are competitive again depends on learning this lesson of uh, unity and discipline. I, th I think um, that uh, Hemingway quote, all of us are broken by the world, but many of us are stronger in the part that was broken is really important for us in the Labor Party at the moment. If we do not learn the lesson of the last few years, then we are um, banished to opposition. So, very briefly, what do you say to those among your colleagues who are calling for Kevin Rudd to resign completely from the Parliament, to walk away from a uh, seat in Griffiths, which obviously would lead to a by-election apart from anything else, which you would most likely lose. Well, I keep saying to you, I'm not going to give um, character analysis no, but of this any is, of the people that's not, involved. That's not character analysis. Our, that is, what are your thoughts our, our about the fact that this is going on and people are calling for him to resign completely uh, from his seat? I, I think we all need to take a deep breath and calm down and have our discussions inside the Labor Party. Do you have an opinion on whether he should resign from his seat? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just 
just spent five minutes saying I'm not going to answer questions like that. I'm not going to engage in that sort of thing. Oh, go on. The answer's yes, you do. No, no, I'm not. <laughs> OK, let's move on. I'm going to take uh, our next question. It's uh, on a different subject. Of course, still related to the election. It's from James Wilson. This question is for Tanya Plibersek. The Coalition this Saturday was given a clear mandate by the Australian people, with the repealing of the carbon tax playing an integral role in the platform on which they ran. Will you seek to block the passage of a bill to repeal the carbon tax in the Senate? And if so, how can you justify this, given that the Australian people have made their opinions on the carbon tax quite clear? Tanya, you were just talking for a while, so I'm going to throw that to Graham Richardson first and come back to you. Well, in my view, um, if I was Tony Abbott, I'd take a, a deep breath as well and I'd slow this process down because I think that new Senate after the 1st of July next year uh, is, a, is, is a Senate which will be far more right-leaning than the current Senate. So if I were him, I, I wouldn't rush to judgement. Uh, it's going to be a, a different Senate. It's going to be full of some very odd people. Um, <laughs> uh, but those odd people tend to be right-wing nutters rather than left-wing nutters. And so the, the, they'll more than likely support uh, a, a Liberal national line, and uh, much more so than the current Senate would. So, but Graham, uh, I, no, Tony Abbott. Well, Tony Abbott's been pretty uh, relentless uh, in his pursuit of the Labor Party. Oh, really? uh, why would why would he not <laughs> why would he not simply put up a separate piece of legislation while the Labor Party is still there in the Senate and challenge them or dare them to actually well, defy his mandate? He can, and they probably will defy his mandate. And that means he'll, if he runs it up the poll three times in a hurry, he gets a double dissolution. OK, good. If, if that's what he wants, he can do it. And he'll have, a, he'll have that done by the middle of next year before the new Senate comes in. But who wants a double dissolution? I mean, I, I think a double dissolution is crazy. I don't think Australia wants it. You won't find a poll with a majority saying it's a good idea. I think the Liberals have just had a big win, a very big win historically. They're sitting there, sitting, they're looking pretty. George is about to get in the big white car and it's his forever. Um, as far as they're concerned, why would they risk it? Why do it? They should just take a deep breath and slow down. George Brandis, will you take a deep breath? Will you slow down? Will you not put the carbon tax legislation before the Senate while the Labor Party's there? Well, what we intend to do is keep our promises. And what we promise to do um, if we won this election is repeal the carbon tax as a first order of business. That was the promise that we put front and centre uh, in our election campaign. Uh, the people voted for us and by doing so, of course, they voted, uh, they expressed the view through the ballot box that they want the carbon tax repealed and uh, it's a matter whether, for the Labor Party, whether the Labor Party respects the obviously declared wishes of the public. Uh, if they decide to defy the wishes of the public, then that's a matter for them and they'll be judged by the public accordingly, but we intend to keep our promises and to deliver what we promised to do. Tanya Pubasek, um, assuming that happens and they do put it up as a separate bill, which they plan to, it'll be a simple bill, yes or no, do we support uh, scrapping the carbon tax or no, do we oppose it? Um, what will Labor do? Well, I'm one member of the caucus and, uh, you know, a caucus would have to make a decision on any legislation that came before us. But I'll tell you what my opinion is. Uh, my opinion is that a third of people, uh, over a third of people voted for the Labor Party knowing that we support uh, a price on carbon as the best and most efficient way of reducing carbon pollution. Uh, many people have voted in the Senate for the Labor Party, the Greens and others who clearly believe that climate change is real and happening and that uh, we need to take action and that a market-based mechanism for taking action is the best and most effective way of reducing carbon pollution. Uh, so uh, I would say in the same way that Tony Abbott did in uh, 2010 after the election then that his members had a mandate to vote uh, against carbon pricing, the people who voted for us voted for us on the assumption that we would vote for carbon pricing to keep it, to keep uh, strong action to protect our world. But Tanya, well, if, I, if I may, um, the people who voted for you did vote uh, for your set of policies. And the people who voted for us voted for our set of policies. And the electorate, by a very clear majority, chose us. Fine. Now, that, and, that, and, no, no, no. And if then I, you'll if get I, it through if, the if House I, of Representatives. If I, if, I, if, I may, if I may finish. There comes a point 
if you've got any respect for democratic values whatsoever. Oh, this is when you're, so no, <laughs> rich. When Tony Abbott said no to everything if, for if, three years. If, if, <laughs> Tanya, you, you interrupted me, so if I may finish. <laughs> I think you began by interrupting her, as a if, matter of fact. If, <laughs> just by the by. If, if, if you've got any respect for democratic values oh, at all, there, so there, 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 comes a point, there comes a point at which there's an election in which one particular policy, in this case the repeal of the carbon tax, becomes the chief oh, what flagship nonsense. policy of the party that is challenging for government, as the repeal of the okay. carbon tax right. was for oh, us, I, and I, I the electorate the votes, vote, and, and the electorate votes <laughs> us in. Okay, right. There, there so, comes so, a right, the wasn't minority it, has it, got to respect the wasn't wishes it of the majority. Fixing the budget emergency. Oh, hang on, we've got two months to do that now. So, 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 so George, can I just interrupt your flow just for a moment? Uh, Tanya, just a quick question here: yes. Will this be a question for the new leader? Whether you do or do not allow it'll, this to go through. It'll be a question for the caucus. All of our decisions are made in the caucus room. OK. Lenore Taylor, want to get in? Uh, yeah, well, I would just make the point that, having watched this for a while, uh, people's views about what constitutes a mandate and what it entitles them to do tend to change dramatically when they move from opposition into government. <laughs> and uh, Tiny Abbott wrote an essay back in 2007 entitled Oppositions to Have Promises to Keep, where he argued that there is, to an extent, a mandate that's won by an opposition party as well. Um, I think it, in the case of the Labor Party, if they abandon carbon pricing now, really the electorate could be entitled to wonder what they stand for because they've fought so long and so hard on it. And the final point I'd make is just it will be really interesting to see when uh, Tony Abbott has to make amendments, changes to things to get them through the Senate with this group of senators that he's going to have to negotiate with or with the Labor Party and the Greens in the first instance, whether <coughs> that is seen as some sort of uh, fundamental breach of promise by him. Because when Julia Gillard had to change the emissions trading scheme to give it a fixed price for the first three years, he paint, because of the, the Greens, he painted that as a fundamental breach of promise with the electorate, a breach of trust. So it would be interesting to see if he looks at it that way when he has to negotiate with other parties to get legislation through the Senate. Um, OK, we're going to move on. We'll keep talking about the Senate. Our next question comes from Angie Pinto. Thanks, Tony. This election, we've seen the rise of the micro-parties, some of whom will land Senate seats with around 1% of the primary vote. It would appear the system is being gamed. So my question is, do we need to review our preferential voting system? That is, do we need electoral reform? Michael Kroger, start with you. Um, yes, we do. Uh, but firstly, uh, you can't blame any of the candidates who ran, and you can't blame any of the candidates that won. And you certainly can't blame that fellow Drury, is it, who, who put all these micro-party preference deals together. Good luck to them. If that's the system, that's our democracy. I have no objection to that and, and wish them all the best, and they have not gamed the system. They, that's the system, and they've operated within it. But I think what we do, do need to do in the Senate is move to optional preferential voting. And the reason for that is that you have a large section of the community that do not understand wh who or what they're voting for when you have a ballot paper that long, as we did. I voted on Saturday and or last week, and it's that long. Um, you don't understand the names of the parties. It should be optional preferential, so I can vote for A and B and C, and that's all if I don't want to vote for the rest. One of the problems you've got also is the fact that the Australian Electoral Commission, to their eternal shame, allowed this party, the Liberal Democrats, to be registered. Now, the Liberal Party opposed this, but they got 8% of the vote in Sydney on Saturday. Uh, they were number one on the ticket, that long ballot paper. They were first. Now, why would they have got 8%? They got 3% elsewhere. People thought, a bit of donkey vote, people thought they were voting for the Liberal Party. So the Commission should never have allowed their registration. But to your fundamental question, does there need to be reform? Yes, there does. We need to move to optional preferential system of voting and to abolish the pre-registration of tickets. So I vote for who I want, as far down the ballot paper as I want. Uh, Tanya Pupzik, optional preferential voting as a, as a way of reforming the system, what do you say? Oh, look, I, th I do think we need to look at the... Just for even practical reasons, the number of people, the number of parties and so on. Uh, I don't know if that's the solution, but we need to have a discussion about it. I used to really enjoy you know, numbering below the line, starting with all the people I like and <laughs> at the other end all the people I hated and meeting somewhere in the middle. And uh, even I didn't have the time or the patience for it um, on Saturday. And I've got to say, there's f few people who are more enthusiastic about their democracy than I am. 
Um, George Brandis, you could well be the Attorney General. It might be a decision for you whether to attempt to uh, reform the system. Um, is that going to be a bit of a priority? <laughs> Would you consider changing the system to optional preferential voting? Well, can I just make or this... Or seeking to. Can, can I just make this point in, in response to your question? Um, all of the people who won, albeit from a, you know, a very, very small base in some cases, won fair and square. They played within the rules. They didn't do anything dishonest. Um, I think it's a bit unfair to say they gamed the system. And, you know, even though I represent one of the, the major parties, it's sometimes refreshing to see that the major parties don't have a complete monopoly on access to the parliament. And, you know, the Senate has a, pro a, a, a proportional representation system uh, and which is relatively friendly to the minor parties. So we so, we so often hear people complain about the, the major parties are a duopoly that, that monopolises the system. I think sometimes when somebody from a, from a, from a small party uh, manages to get elected as a result of the way the Senate quota and preferential system uh, works, that can actually be, be a refreshing thing. Now, now having said that, I, I do think that there is um, there's some uh, wisdom in what Michael Kroger has said about um, introducing above the line um, preferential voting <coughs> or perhaps even optional preferential voting uh, in the system because I think the, the people who are... Do, who, who, the electors who are casting their ballot do need more transparency as to the likely outcome of the ballot and to have, to have um, that completely obscure to them as a result of arrangements made um, between individual groups of candidates um, uh, um, is, I think, something that uh, perhaps... So, so just to <coughs> summarise, the system's working brilliantly, but it's actually broken and you'd fix I'm not, it? No, I, no, no, I'm <laughs> just, no, I'm not... Uh, Tony, please, please don't verbally. The, the system is not broken, in my view. I think the system works very well, but I think the system is not incapable of improvement. And where I would seek to uh, look at uh, making improvements is to increase the, uh, the, the degree of transparency. I'd be very interested to see if George <coughs> thought it was as refreshing that micro-parties got elected on half a percent of the vote if they were parties from the far left uh, rather than parties that he thinks will probably be easier for him to negotiate with in the Senate. But I have to agree with both George and Michael that I do think it has to be uh, reformed because really because of the transparency issue and because while you want small parties to have a look in, you really... They should be parties that have made a case to the people and have got some proportion of the vote and have some policies. I mean, it seems like we're going to get a senator whose main <coughs> and possibly only policy is that he's in favour of sport. Well, good, good luck to him. I'm in favour of sport, but I'd like no, you to have but, a tax policy. Let's say, let's say, let's say, George, you've had a fair crack. that's what he cares you're about. You've had a fair crack. Look, I've got to say this. You may think it's refreshing. I take the view that a bloke who eats kangaroo poo is not someone I really want in the Senate. Now, I, I, call me old-fashioned, but I, I don't like that idea. But, uh, Graham, somebody, Graham, I, Graham, I, how, do you, how do you know so, we're out there already? So, so, some of the, well, I, I, look, I, I don't know what George does in his quieter moments, in the darker as hours of the night, but I bet he doesn't eat kangaroo poo. As long as he keeps it... OK, we've got to... So I, got to hang on, I, I've got, right, I've got okay, to finish right, this. Okay. Yes, sure. um, I, I have a very... You're on a roll. A very different view Richard. here about to Michael and, uh, and George about... Uh, about this uh, optional preferential voting. Effectively, what you're doing when you do that is abolishing preferential voting. There'll be no preferential voting because uh, who is going to go take the trouble to find out what 80 people stand for? Answer, no one. N not even someone like I Tanya with a D. <laughs> anyway, uh, it's too hard to find them. You know, some of them you've never heard of. I'm By the way, I'd never heard of the Liberal time. Democrats until they got elected. But you see, but uh, an 8% you've no, no, got to allow <laughs> them. Okay. But I, th I believe in a quota system of, say, 4% or something like that. So you don't get someone who looks like in Western Australia with 1,700 votes who's going to get elected. I think that's a farce. OK, all right. I would we stop it. I'm just going to stop you there because we've got a question from the floor. We'll quickly take your question or comment, whichever. Sure. Just back to your uh, comment, Lenore. Why should the minor parties have to have policies when neither of the majors do? <laughs> <laughs> OK. We will take that as a comment. Very good one, however. Um, the next question is from Laura Ryan. <laughs> Why do you think the Palmer United Party proved so popular? And, presuming he wins Fairfax, how do you think Palmer will be as an MP? George Randis, let's start with you as a fellow Queenslander. Well, I, I, actually, I actually know Clive Palmer quite well, and I, can't, I must confess I, I rather like Clive Palmer. I, I've I'm not surprised he was the biggest I've, campaign donor for the I've, LNP I've, for many years. I've known, <laughs> I've, I've, no, I've known Clive forever. In fact, we were in the Young Liberals together many, many, many long years ago. 
Um, I think Clive Palmer um, appealed to... We were talking before about the micro-parties. Well, there's nothing micro about Clive, but... Um, <laughs> the, the, um, I think he appealed to a, a somewhat similar section of the electorate, a section of the electorate that doesn't like the idea of a duopoly of the major parties. And um, he had a lot of local appeal at the Sunshine Coast, where he has his... His, um, his dinosaur part. Um, <laughs> um, now, um, I think... Uh, but uh, the, the one... The, the, main, the main point I want to make about Clive Palmer is this. He is a serious guy who ought to be taken seriously. And unlike a lot of people um, in the business community um, who are, shall we say, fair-weather friends to the free enterprise side of politics, at least he's had the spine to stand up for his <coughs> beliefs and participate in the political process and, 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 and to the point of standing for and being elected to Parliament. Now, I, I wish some of our other entrepreneurs were, were as intrepid as he is, frankly. Yeah, Graham Richardson, uh, I'll bring you in here. Now, it's, it's one of the most interesting phenomena of the entire election, actually. How do you go from being from scratch, pretty much, to being a party that's a, a, a big political force in less than a year? Well, you spend $15 million in the last week of the campaign, that doesn't do you any harm. Um, and I might, you know, you've got to remember, this guy's a very ex experienced person in politics. Yes, he is. He was the media person for Joe Jockey Peterson. I don't know what you thought of Joe Jockey Peterson. The media handling was superb. Mm. I mean, it was arguably the best Australia has ever seen. And so uh, this guy's no mug and he's advertising. I mean, it, it might be ridiculous economics. I'll give you all $2,500. And when you turn that over 10 times, it's worth more than it was when it started. It's a very weird, a very, very weird way of doing business. But nonetheless, um, it, it appeals. He is folksy. Um, he's very charming. If, mm. if you actually ever get to, to talk to this bloke, he's very charming. And um, he's very witty. He's a good sort of person you want to go to lunch with. And a lot of people will want to vote for him. That having been said, can you imagine this bloke running a $3 billion empire, as he claims, turning up to vote for the prickly pear eradication bill in the parliament? You know, getting up for all those divisions late at night. Not Clive. Well, and also Not Clive. on election night saying that, in fact, he couldn't see any problem with having his business interests and having a vote in the Senate and he didn't think there was anything called conflict of interest. And, and just imagine, well, when, when he, he has his register of interest, how long will it take you to go and search it? I think it could be a while. <laughs> um, let me go to Michael Kroger on this. And, uh, we are talking about someone who, during the course of the campaign, uh, accused Wendy Deng of being a Chinese spy, <laughs> <laughs> among other things. I mean, uh, can you imagine what he'll do with parliamentary privilege? <laughs> Well, Paul May, yeah. <laughs> He'll root them out one way or the other. But, Tony, you know, you've missed the biggest point, which is you launched his career. <laughs> yeah. I you launched his career. That's a bit those, harsh. No, those people that have seen Clive interviewed by Tony Jones on Late Line, uh, he describes you as the best interviewer in Australia. <laughs> um, and I, take, you... I take no credit for his opinions, good or no, bad. No, no, no. Um, anyway, he hasn't accused me of being a Chinese spy. No, at he hasn't. No, it's coming. It's oh, coming. Yeah. Look, um, uh, I agree with George. Um, if you make a billion dollars, you're no mug. Um, I don't care how people try to ridicule him. Uh, he's a very clever guy, very clever campaigner. He got a vote no one thought of. I must admit, I had no idea he was going to get 30% of the primary vote in his seat. We thought there was a chance in Queensland to get the Senate position, but that primary vote in his seat stunned everybody in the political establishment and everybody out of the political establishment. So he got the votes from a lot of people just basically disenchanted with politics in general. He offers hope to aspirational people, and uh, good luck to him. And, yeah. you know, Michael, there, there is a, a bit of a theme in both of the last discussions of mocking the outsider, yeah. whether it be the micro-parties or whether it be somebody like Clive Palmer. And I don't think we should be mocking the outsider. Mm. And very so often... Who and, very, and, and, very, no, and, and very often... I don't, I don't think you can say that was a theme, mocking very, the very, outsider. Very, very often, very often, when people who, who think themselves sophisticates and outsiders uh, and insiders do mock the outsider, then they find themselves completely at variance with but public George, opinion. Look at, look, at, look, at, look at Pauline Hanson years ago. She was mocked because she was seen to be an outsider. Mm. And yet she tapped into a vein He's of Australian public opinion. He's not an outsider. Can, He's an outsider. Can I just, can I just make, can, 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 I, can I just make the point that your own leader, Tony Abbott, spent a good deal of time running around the country trying to destroy Pauline Hanson's career uh, during the uh, GST election? I'm, 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 I'm merely observing 
that <laughs> I'm merely observing, if, perhaps against my own interests, that all wisdom does not lie in our, the Coalition or the Labor Party and we shouldn't be mocking the outsiders. But right, without I'm, wishing, I'm, 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 without I'm, I'm, wishing to mock them, it doesn't mean you can't point out that some of their policies make absolutely no sense. Um, There's also the point with Clive Palmer that he's into self-mockery, so um, yeah. you, can, you can also laugh Very at endearing. his jokes. So, so Tanya Plimsic. Well, I think there's a couple of things. Um, first of all, if I read his ads and uh, I, I didn't follow politics closely and it said, uh, I want to put $70 billion into the economy to stimulate the economy, I want to spend more on health, I want to spend more on education, uh, the, everything he said... Uh, if you were not a close follower of um, politics, you'd go, oh, that sounds like a good idea, that sounds like a good idea. It, a bad idea to stop the boats, bring refugees on the, an aeroplane. The, there's, the, the, there's... Get rid uh, of the carbon tax. It, it, it's the how are you ever going to achieve any of these things. And um, I, I, I think people uh, haven't asked how... Of Clive Palmer. Well, he might uh, take the view much. that from little things, big things grow, or in his case, from big things, bigger <laughs> things grow. <laughs> uh, let's move on because we've got a few other things to talk about. You're uh, watching QA. It's the Monday after the election. There's a lot to discuss. Our next question comes from Brenda Carter. Thank you, Tony. Um, the Labour le leadership seems to be a poisoned chalice. And I'm just wondering um, how the panel think that Bill Shorten, um, if he'll be. Uh, willing to take up the position given his role in toppling Julia in, uh, and Kevin before her. Mm. Graham Richardson. Well, I, as, as of this morning, I didn't think Bill was going to stand. As of this afternoon, I think he might. Um, Albo was no hope of standing last Friday, but he's a fair chance now. And so what's going to happen, one would imagine, over the next couple of days is not just all the caucus <coughs> ringing each other to see who they're going to support, the two of them have to get together. The last thing that Labor can afford is a ballot. Uh, Labor has to be unified. And under these new rules, if you have a ballot, you won't find the result till Christmas, and I think that's a bit okay. silly. We need, we need to get on with the job. I think the two of them should have a talk um, and, and decide who's going to run this show, who's going to run it, who'll be deputy, and, and we'll, we'll all move on. If, if Labor have a ballot now, um, the trouble is there's so much poison in the air that it just worries me it'll get out of hand and you'll have more of the Craig Emerson type stuff from tonight coming out. So if I were them, I'd get together and I would just settle it. Uh, Lenore Taylor, that I guess is old Labor talking. Uh, is, there a, is there a new Labor position, do you think? Well, I just find it interesting. You know, Labor's gone on and on and on about the way that they open up the party and revitalise the party as if they have this sort of more democratic way of choosing party officials and now leaders. Um, that's always been stymied at party conference because the unions didn't like it. Then Kevin Rudd sort of forced it upon them. But now at the first chance to actually use it, we're told they can't possibly do that. It'd be too divisive. I mean, you can run a civilised ballot for party leadership where two people put forward their, their credentials in a civilised manner. And it probably says something not very good about the Labor Party if they really think that they can't do that. And it makes you wonder what the reform was for. Can you put a sec? I don't. I don't think Graham's actually speaking for the Labor Party when he says no, that. Um, it's just his opinion. That's right. And I, What's your I don't opinion? think. Well, uh, I think that it would be um, perfectly fine to have a ballot, and it, the conduct of the ballot is is important. It has to be conducted in a in a civil way. But I think Labor Party members were delighted when we made the change to uh, give them a say in the leadership, and uh, we've got um, you know potentially uh, a couple of very good candidates there. I don't, uh, I don't know um, whether you know, either or both of them will stand, but I don't think there would be any harm at all in having that democratic process. And in fact, if they did, would you stand? I mean, uh, uh, why, why not throw it, another hat in the ring, a well, woman? You know, why not have 16? But I think, the, um, I think that uh, a lot of people um, who have joined in my area lately have joined because they got uh, activated by the community pre-selection process that we ran, which was a, 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 like a, a primary sort of uh, process at local government level. It brought a lot of really good interested people, people who are Labor supporters for a long time but had never really kind of bothered to sign up. Um, wanted to sign up because they would have a say then in who represented them. And I think that uh, there is the potential for it to have that rejuvenating effect um, for Labor Party members uh, should, we, um, should we go with the um, <coughs> rank-and-file ballot 
as so, well. So you, you would have heard Mark Latham this morning, a former leader, and he was basically saying that, well, uh, really pretty much what Graham Richardson is saying, that people should be on the phone, will be on the phone now, oh, the, the factional <laughs> warlords and sub-factional <laughs> warlords on the phone or actually having uh, dinner at uh, a Chinese uh, mm. uh, <laughs> restaurant in Sussex Street um, well, to nut out who's actually going to be the leader. A actually, it, it, no, I don't think that is happening. We, we um, okay. don't even oh. know all of the people who have been elected yet to the caucus. We don't know the final number of the caucus. Uh, we don't know the final makeup of it. Uh, the new rules actually um, give us quite a long period. It's not um, until Christmas, as, as Graham said, but uh, you know, quite a long period from uh, the first caucus meeting um, before the decision would be made. Well, the Parliament's not coming back. We're here today till November. I don't see that anybody should be in any hurry. We need to choose someone that can um, uh, take us to the next election and uh, potentially win and be Prime Minister, but also someone who would be around for two terms or longer if that, if that was our fate. So we need to choose carefully and there's no point rushing it. Michael Kroger, um, the question was about Bill Shorten and I wonder, um, as a fellow Victorian, is he someone that you think would provide uh, the most firepower for Labor, if you could look at it objectively? Well, how could anyone in this country trust Bill Shorten? Oh. <laughs> how could anybody trust Bill Shorten? Well... I mean, look at it this way. He should have been the leader, by the way, in 2.10, after they got rid of Rudd. They should have put Shorten in, but they put Gillard in, who didn't work out so well. Now, I don't mind people having a go at a leader, knocking them off as they knocked off Rudd, because Rudd was a disaster. Despite what Tanya says about what a great job they did during the GFC, they did kick him out in June 2010 after he'd saved the world from the GFC, saved Australia. So he wasn't that good that they didn't want to kick him out. But what I really can't abide, and what I don't think Australians can abide, is when the polls go down, as I said earlier, because of the Rudd undermining, that Bill Shorten, having said on 100 occasions publicly about Gillard, I support my Prime Minister. I support our Prime Minister. Our Prime Minister will lead us to the election. And on the day of the ballot, puts out a release at 11 o'clock saying, I'm still supporting Julie Gillard. At 5.30 he says, no, nah, I'm stabbing her in the back. And he takes Penny Wong with him. In other words, the people of Double Delt that got rid of Rudd and then got rid of Gillard, how do you trust those people? You know, for me as an outsider, at least, you know, in politics sometimes there's honour in defeat. And I look at people like Conroy and Howes and Swan and Ludwig, n none of whom, none of whom, whose views I agree with, but I'd at least say to myself, well, they were honourable. They and, and Emerson, you know, they voted against Rudd, but at least they stuck with Gillard and went down with the ship. They didn't double deal like Shorten did. So if Shorten gets the leadership, terrific for the Liberal Party. And, and this is this is Michael's this is Michael's um, you know little bit of money in the bank in case Bill does get up. Uh, he's already started trashing Bill. I, I think it's really um, he trashed himself, Tanya. You, no, I, I, I think it's um, pretty poor form, Michael, to uh, be attacking him what, already. What, what fact does Michael Kroger yeah. mention that you dispute? Well, let me start. Because I mean, I, I, Michael and I have had this argument now several times in the last few days, and we'll have it again. Um, I think what he's saying is outrageous. To, mm. to, to, to have a crack at Shorten and Penny Wong over the fact that they switched from Gillard to Rudd really irritates me. If you look at the two of them, they, they absolutely agonised over this for a long, long time. Both of them thought it should happen, but neither of them wanted to, to, to walk away from the position that they'd held for a long time. This was not easy for either of them. They hated it. But in the end, they put the party first as far as they were concerned. Now, I've been involved in a few leadership changes. Um, you know, I, I had a hand in getting Hawke up, but a pretty fair hand in getting him out. All I can say is, yes, it makes you some enemies, Michael, but people do get over it, people do move on. Bill Shorten is a very decent human <laughs> being a terrific member and he will lead the Labor Party at some point. And as far as I'm concerned, that'll be a good thing that happens, not a bad one. OK, with the time we've got left, I'm going to jump over the Labor Party and we've got a question... Thank oh, God for that. In, a question <laughs> oh. for the Liberal Party and it's uh, from Joanna Chin. We'll just get a microphone to you, Joanna. No, Sorry, hang on a sec. We'll just get a microphone to you. There we go. Thank you. Now that Tony Abbott is Prime Minister, would he be looking into other economic reforms to strengthen the Australian economy, apart from the repeal of the carbon tax? George Brandis. Well, he certainly will. And, um, of course, as I said before, we put the repeal of the carbon tax front and centre of, of our election campaign, but that's not the end of our economic agenda. We've got an ambitious agenda 
to create two million jobs. We have to start repaying this enormous burden of debt that the Labor Party has left can us. I, can I put it to you that that well, is not an economic reform? Uh, paying well, off, paying off the debt. No, no, that's not well, I, I beg to disagree <laughs> with you. It, 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 may, it, it may be good well, economic management, but it isn't an economic reform. Well, I suppose it all depends what you it mean by the... I, I think what, carbon uh, uh, pricing. The, um, may, may I answer the question, please? Um, if you would, yes. The, uh, that'd be great. I, I, consider, I consider paying off the mountain of debt that, we, that the Labor mm. Party raked up in less than six years a very, very important economic priority. Absolutely. OK, but that's fair but, enough. But it is an economic priority for you. It is not an economic reform. So the question is, are there economic reforms, I think that's correct, apart from the carbon tax or repealing the carbon tax, uh, that you are about to engage in? Is there a reforming agenda that we don't know about? There's no, Well, th this is a no surprise as government. There's no agenda that, w that nobody <laughs> knows about. There is no agenda that nobody knows about. There is, there, is, there is no agenda that other than what we set out in our election um, campaign, in our policies, in our real solutions document. That was the most detailed economic and social agenda that any political party has brought before the Australian people in 20 years. Oh. And, if you want, and, and, if you, and if you want to know, then it was all laid out before the public during the election campaign. Repaying the debt repealing the carbon tax, repealing the mining tax, um, creating the modern infrastructure that the economy needs, particularly the road infrastructure, um, creating two million jobs, reducing the cost of living pressures on families, restoring business, particularly small business, to profitability, having a root and branch reform of the competition laws, particularly with the, from the point of view of the interests of small business, developing the North. I think that's a pretty good agenda. I, I think okay. it, right. there was one, thing, one reform you didn't mention, I think it's the only real reform the Liberals are interested in, and that will be IR reform. I, I think they're seriously interested in having a crack at IR. I'm not sure they've worked out how far they're prepared to go, how far they're game to go, but that will be the area to watch, because there's no question they will have a crack there. Can, can I say... The idea that that Real Solutions program was detailed at 17 pages is the funniest thing I've heard all night. Um, and the... the um, well, you getting obviously rid read of, the wrong document, get, Tanya. Get, getting rid of uh, carbon pricing. You keep talking about the carbon tax. We've moved to a fl floating price now. Uh, no, so no. what you're talking about is getting rid of carbon pricing. You're talking about getting rid of a market mechanism well, you actually for reducing... Moved well, to a floating, you haven't, you haven't moved to a floating price because you, you yes. didn't legislate for it, and that was right. the problem. That's uh, the fundamental. Okay. It's, it's a promise that never but, actually happened. But what, they're, but what they're talking about is getting rid of uh, carbon pricing altogether. A floating carbon and tax. Uh, talking about getting rid of a market mechanism for reducing pollution and instead uh, taxing everyone to pay big polluters maybe to drop their pollution a bit. Uh, if, it, if it costs more than you've set aside for it, then the pollution target goes. You've already said that. Um, when it comes to the other things that you've mentioned, uh, you're talking about the cost of living, for example. Um, mortgage interest rates have never been lower. People on a $300,000 uh, mortgage are paying $6,000 a year less on their mortgage than when we came to government. After 10 successive interest rate hikes under the Howard government, after the promise that mortgage interest rates would always be lower under a Liberal government. Just as one example, you're getting rid of the school kids bonus. Okay, right, okay, I'm sorry. It's to okay, me so very much as if you're fighting the last election yeah, campaign. It does sound you a bit like that, on. but uh, the question was about yeah. economic reform from the coalition. I'm going to throw to Michael Kroger. Do you identify among those policies any major economic reforms? I do, but um, and I don't want to dodge the question, but um, I'm not part of the government. We have a new government and I, I can't speak for George or Joe Hockey or Tony Abbott because that would be... Uh, I'm just important. talking about you as an observer, looking at the document. Are there, do you see in amongst them major economic reforms? I do, but 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 as I said, um, I'm not going to interfere with them. And that's for Joe Hockey to announce and Andrew Robb and, and Tony and not, not, not for me. Oh, so none that have been announced so far then? Um, sorry, what's your question? Uh, whether, whether you've actually seen, announced, any major economic reforms by the, from the incoming government? Well, they've announced basically um, $40 billion of cuts to federal government spending. That has got to be a reform because, as 
we know Tanya's left behind three hundred billion dollars worth oh. of debt. Oh, you know, oh, it's, well, it's you nothing. Know, you know, it's twelve no, billion dollars a year. You, you, you can't even. You can't it shrug it off. You know, you're cutting forty billion, and you're spending what is it, thirty four or thirty six? Yeah. It, it means that you come in back into a surplus at the same time as us. Uh, the you, over four years, you're saying that you'll spend six billion dollars less than we would have. That's a billion and a half dollars a year in in a budget the size of the Australian budget. Most people would call that a rounding error. Mm, okay. As I was saying, well, if you regard you've six us, billion dollars as a rounding error, Tanya, I think that kind of sums up a lot of the problem. Uh, no, of Tanya, you're, you're leaving a twelve billion. billion you're leaving a twelve billion dollar. In you're leaving our budget a budget is very little. You're leaving a twelve billion dollar interest bill a year behind you. Three hundred billion dollars in gross debt, rising unemployment, and interest rates are only low, Tanya. Not because the economy is good, because the economy is rotten. That's why interest rates are so low in this country. And for you to come on and say, "Oh, we did a great job during the FGFC," um, well, if you did such a good job, why did you sack Kevin Rudd? So the bottom line is, okay. Uh, uh, so, all right, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. No, I'm just. I'd like no, to interrupt. To uh, no, I'd like to interrupt this. Is, okay, all right. The briefly. If debt is such a problem, why are you not coming back to surplus sooner than you are? Well, the answer to that is that the policies that Tony Abbott and Co are going to bring in are designed to increase GDP in this country. If you increase GDP in this country, you increase the tax base. And that's basically the way the government is proposing to pay down debt and to reduce the budget surplus in addition to the measures that have already been mentioned. But because the economy is so weak, you can't take billions of dollars out of the infrastructure, the economic infrastructure of this country because you will damage the economy further. And because it's so weak, because unemployment is going to 6.25% and because your finance minister, Penny Wong, and your predecessor treasurer, Wayne Swan, left $116 billion of errors in the 11-12 budget. That's one of the reasons this economy is in such a mess because of you. That's now, Michael, nice. Michael, now my question to you, just to sort of finish off, would, do you think the business community, for example, is looking to see major economic reforms coming from the coalition government, either in the area of industrial relations, as suggested uh, there by Graham Richardson, or, for example, taxation? Uh, mm. Because there is, there is a cry for taxation reform from economists and from the business community that I've heard, and I'm just wondering, is the coalition going to respond to it? Well, the business community will always want things which are going to be, um, you know, a system in increasing profits. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that, but all these things are a matter of balance. And uh, that's why, quite frankly, I think Abbott's going to be a very good Prime Minister. Lenore Taylor. Um, well, I think the, the take-out message from that whole exchange is that a lot of the policies that uh, Tony Abbott will rely on to make good his economic promises, we don't know yet. They've been put out to reviews beyond the election, so tax policy, industrial relations policy, competition policy, foreign um, investment policy. <coughs> We, we don't have those detailed policies. Childcare policy is another one. They're all going to be reviewed and, and we'll find out about them later. So uh, in the absence of those detailed policies, what we do have is statements of intent, uh, which may or may not happen. But I don't really see, if you don't come back to surplus uh, any quicker, how you're going to do anything about the debt more quickly either. Uh, and also sort of sort of grand statements of things that are going to happen. I heard Andrew Robb say on the weekend that the coalition government would reboot the mining industry. Now, it may be that business confidence improves under the coalition. That could well be. But the investment boom in the mining industry came off because Chinese growth slowed. And as significant an event as Tony Abbott's ascent to the Prime Ministership is, I don't think it's going to do anything for Chinese growth. George Brandis, I'll give a, uh, the word to you because we're going to go out pretty soon. Well, I think the the greatest thing that could have happened in Australia to restore business confidence was a change of government. I mean, if the business community had absolutely given up on the Labor government, there was no policy integrity, there was no policy predictability, there was no um, stability in the government itself and the personnel in the senior economic and other portfolios. So by the, 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 the mere fact of a change of government with the clear direction Tony Abbott and Joe Hockey and others have set out, I think is the best thing that could possibly have but, happened but you given for business them confidence policies. for business confidence in Australia today. I'm afraid that's where we'll have to leave it. We're, uh, we've run out of time. Please thank the panel: Lenore Taylor, Graham Richardson, uh, George Brandis, Tanya Plibersek, and Michael Kroger. <laughs> thank you very much. And next Monday. We'll have a clearer idea of the Senate, we hope, the final distribution of seats, we hope, and the makeup of the first Abbott ministry. We
confidently expect. And uh, we're hoping that the newest phenomenon in Australian politics, the leader of the Palmer United Party, Clive Palmer himself, will join our Q&A panel to take your questions. Along with Australia's best-known playwright, David Williamson, whose new play dramatises the life of Rupert Murdoch. Social researcher and director of the Mind and Mood Report, Rebecca Huntley, and two yet-to-be-named representatives of the major parties. So uh, until next week's Q&A, good night.